That's the story. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Okay, aloha my thank you everybody for coming. Um, this meeting, I'm hoping, will get us a little further than we have been in the past to a point of implementation. There's been no question that the state of Hawaii is illegal. Um, anyway, to that point, I want to introduce you to Professor Williamson Chang, who is a professor at the University of Hawaii Law School. And uh, I'll let him take it from here to describe the legalities or illegalities of the state of Hawaii. Mahalo. Uh, mahalo. Hey. Hey. Uh, as I was introduced, my name is Williamson Chang. I'm a professor of law at the University of Hawaii School of Law. I've been there for 37 years. I've taught all kinds of courses, including history of Hawaii, um, Native Hawaiian rights, indigenous people's rights, also corporations, uh, securities regulations. Uh, but I've been there a long time. Uh, I am Native Hawaiian. I'm Chinese, Hawaiian, Irish. So um, I'm probably, I was the first Native Hawaiian professor at the, at the School of Law. And I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes. Uh, Hanalei wanted me to talk about what you probably have come to your own conclusions, which is that the United States doesn't have jurisdiction over the Hawaiian Islands, neither does the state of Hawaii, and uh, there's really two ways to come about this and reach this conclusion. One is through international law that Hawaii was recognized as an independent sovereign state in 1844 by the United States, and it has continued that the overthrow was self-proclaimed, that it was not a true overthrow, that the Republic of Hawaii that followed it really also didn't have control of Hawaii. It was control that was bolstered by the United States military presence. And so we come to that point in 1898 where the United States claims that it acquired Hawaii by annexation. Now I come from it from the point of view of American law and under American law I'm going to point out how the United States admits and actually confesses that it never acquired the Hawaiian Islands. But first let me go through some basics about international law and the acquisition of territory. A sovereign state, a nation like the United States, can only acquire territory in three different ways. One is it can discover territory, uh, the rule of discovery. The second is by conquest. And the third is by treaty. So all the, all the acquisitions of the, of the countries of the world have either been by discovery conquest or a treaty. So discovery applies to the acquisition of lands or territory that has never been claimed by another nation. You understand that? It's like land that is vacant, land that's unclaimed, like a Pacific Island or an area of the United States said the United States of America, the territory of America was not claimed by the Native Americans. So if it's not claimed by any other nation, if it's not within the territorial boundaries of another nation, it can be discovered and taken by another nation which plants its flag and claims dominion over it. So, would, would discovery apply in the case of Hawaii? Can the United States have said that it discovered Hawaii? No, it can't. Because Hawaii was an international independent state starting in 1844 that claimed jurisdiction and dominion over all the Hawaiian Islands, including the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, but also claimed jurisdiction over the channel waters between the islands. So discovery is not a means by which the United States can claim to acquire the Hawaiian Islands, so we can rule that out. They can't use the argument of discovery. The second is by conquest. Over time, you are probably familiar with countries that have conquered other countries. The doctrine of, contra, of conquest says when you reduce another nation to rubble, basically, you destroy its civil structure, and you destroy its government, and you occupy it, 
Well, it's just a matter of fact that you control it. So you can consider uh, a country that's conquered to have been acquired by the conquering country. Now, does the United States claim conquest of Hawaii? No. Uh, it doesn't claim it, and it couldn't prove the facts of conquest. It never destroyed the Hawaiian uh, government. It never completely take, took over the Hawaiian government. So that leaves only one way in which the United States could acquire Hawaii, and that's by treaty. And so you probably see, if you watch the, how many of you watch the DOI hearing, at least a little? You've probably seen these signs that say, no treaty of annexation, occupation. Well, there were, what does this mean, no treaty, occupation? In 1897, after the overthrow, the overthrow aside, five years later, or four years later, the United States and the puppet government, the Republic of Hawaii, attempted to enter into a treaty of annexation. And they signed it, but it had to be ratified, that is, agreed to by the various governments, the government of the Republic of Hawaii and the government of the United States. The treaty required that in its article number seven. Yeah. So, oh, so uh, well, we've heard of the Koi petitions, right? Have you heard of the petitions known as the Koi petitions? The 21,000 people, mostly Native Hawaiians, but all Hawaiian nationals, who protested the Treaty of Annexation in the fall of 1897. These are our ancestors, our Kukuna, who signed these documents protesting the Treaty of Annexation. And the Treaty of Annexation was not ratified because of that. The United States was the country which did not ratify the Treaty of Annexation. The Republic of Hawaii, the puppet government, did ratify the Treaty of Annexation. I want to emphasize this point so that you realize that we didn't have a treaty, one, because it was protested by 21,000 Hawaiians, and it was not passed why? Because the United States people protested and objected to an annexation of a friendly country without the consent of the majority of the people. So it's the United States people who blocked the annexation of Hawaii. The annexation by treaty required two-thirds of the Senate of the United States, senators who were present at that time, to ratify the treaty. And we didn't, they couldn't get two-thirds of the Senate. So what happened? In 1898, the United States went to war against Spain. And in that war against Spain, the uh, president, the newly elected president, President McKinley, said, oh, I want to take Hawaii. I need it as a base for, in, for invading the Philippines. And so he said, how are we going to take Hawaii? We can't pass a treaty let's use a joint resolution. Now, what is a joint resolution? It's a joint resolution not between two countries. That's not what joint means, not Hawaii and the United States. It's a joint resolution of the two houses of Congress, the Senate and the House. What it is, is nothing more than a law, an act of Congress. It's not a treaty. It's, it's a document or a law passed by one side not both sides. Now the reason they went for the joint resolution was it didn't require two-thirds. It only required one half of the House and one half of the Senate to pass. They figured they could get one half of the Senate to vote for a joint resolution. But a joint resolution is not a treaty. So the point I'm making is there are three ways to take territory, and the United States knows that. It's discovery, concourse, or treaty. In fact, the United States has taken every territory that it's acquired since the colonies were established by treaty. But the joint resolution was not a treaty, and I discovered this when I looked up the debates in Congress. In the, in the Senate of the United States, 
There are senators saying a joint resolution has no power to acquire territory of, the, of another country. It has no power outside of the United States to acquire dominion. Doesn't that make sense? In other words, if an act of the Congress of the United States could acquire Hawaii, an act of the Congress or the legislature of Hawaii could acquire the United States. So what does it mean to be sovereign, is to be absolutely in control and in power as to your territory, so that it means that no one else can pass laws under their sovereignty to acquire your sovereignty. Sovereignty is absolute power, and what we mean by absolute is no one else can trump you. So for all these years, the United States has claimed that it has acquired the Hawaiian Islands by a joint <laughs> resolution. And it's funny that we've forgotten the fact that in 1898, the senators who opposed the joint resolution made it clear that it had no power to acquire Hawaii. But the President of the United States got his way. He got a majority of the Senate to pass the act called the joint resolution, and they pretended, they claimed, that it was the basis for acquiring the Hawaiian Islands. In 1900, the Congress of the United States passed what's called the Organic Act. The Organic Act is like a constitution or governing document that tells you how the Hawaiian Islands are to be governed. But the Organic Act, I discovered 20 years ago, in its section two, the second section of the Organic Act, said that the only islands in the United States were those acquired by the Joint Resolution. They didn't name in the Organic Act Oahu or Maui or Kauai as the territory of the United States. They just said the islands that were acquired by Joint Resolution would become part of the United States. Uh, what did we just say? What did I just say? I just said that a Joint Resolution can't acquire islands, territory of Hawaii. So in 1900, what do you have? You have an admission by the United States that it didn't take Hawaii. You have an admission by the United States itself, a confession, so to speak, that it had no power over the Hawaiian Islands. The same thing happened at statehood in 1959 when they had to define the territory of the state of Hawaii. They made the same decision. We cannot take Hawaii. A joint resolution can't take it. So an act of Congress admitting Hawaii is an act of Congress just like the joint resolution. That wouldn't succeed. So they said in effect, what's in the state of Hawaii is whatever was in the state, uh, whatever was in the territory of Hawaii. We just went over what was in the territory of Hawaii was nothing, none of the Hawaiian Islands. So do they have jurisdiction over Hawaii? No, no, they don't have jurisdiction over Hawaii. Have they pretended they have jurisdiction of Hawaii? Yes, they passed laws ever since 1900. They've acted like they've had jurisdiction. It's interesting, in 1988, an advisor who wrote a document for the State Department admitted, we don't know what power we acquired Hawaii by. Excuse me, that deserved a pause. Someone in the United States government wrote, we don't know what power we took Hawaii by. And there's a rule in law that if you claim sovereignty, you have the obligation, you have the burden of proving it. You have to show that you have the papers to show that you own a car, that you own a house, that you own a bicycle. You got it from somebody who had it before. You go to Sears, they give you a receipt. Sears had it, now you have it. The United States, in effect, doesn't have a receipt from Sears. <laughs> what they say is, we have a receipt. Here's our receipt, it's the joint resolution. But they wrote it themselves. That's like you going to Sears, taking the bicycle back, a bicycle that you found on the street, and saying, I want it to be repaired. And the guy from Sears says, okay, we'll repair it if you can show that you bought it from us. Do you have a receipt? No, I don't have a receipt. Well, then how can you say we have an obligation to repair it for you? I can write you a receipt. <laughs> Sears sold to me a bicycle. 
And he would laugh and say, that's your handwriting. I didn't sign it. Sears didn't sign it. So what I'm saying is we don't have a document in which there's two signatures on it that says Hawaii was transferred from the government of Hawaii or the nation of Hawaii to the United States. We have a document made up by one person saying, I have Hawaii. And when you do that, you can't describe what you took because you have nothing, no receipt that says you took it, you get the service contract, you get the wheels, you get the, you get the seat, you get the handlebars. So, in a nutshell, where my research comes from at the University of Hawaii is that the United States, under its own rules, admits that it doesn't have jurisdiction. So everything that has gone on, well, has been a charade. And the best argument that they have is it's been wrong for so long, it's right. But it can never be right if it's wrong. A nation cannot take advantage of a wrong it's committed in international law. It occupies Hawaii. Now, what does occupation mean? Uh, Leon can tell you, Dexter can tell you. My job was to, sit, was to present to you in a short period of time the shortest proof why the United States and the state of Hawaii doesn't have jurisdiction. And the answer is, they've admitted it. It's in the laws itself. In other words, who's disobeying the United States laws? It's the courts. It's the judges. Indeed, it's the law profession from where we can start and say, you have an obligation when you go into court to be candid, to tell the truth, to look at the law. For the last 120 years, they've ignored the law. They've said, oh, we know what's in Hawaii. We know what's in the state. It's Oahu. We'll just assume that's true. We'll take what's called judicial notice. It's like saying, oh, what time is it? I don't have to prove it. It's 1245. I don't have to prove it. You know, the Oahu is within the state of Hawaii. Yes, you do have to prove it. And when put to the proof, they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. I said, you show that Oahu is in the state of Hawaii. What would that mean? You'd have to show that Oahu was acquired by the United States by the joint resolution. And they couldn't show it. So I want to stop here and ask if you have any questions, because I took enough time. But that's the short way of explaining to you what's going on in the hearings. There's been a major change ever since the CEO of OHA, Dr. Crab, asked, is the Kingdom of Hawaii still in existence? He was asking, do you have jurisdiction in the United States? And so they took back the letter, but somebody read it at the Department of Interior. And somebody panicked. And somebody said they know what's going on. So we better rush this idea of federal recognition. Let's hurry up. Let's get it settled. We don't want to hear any more about occupation. But what have we heard as they go around the islands? Hawaiians are focused. They're not all over the place anymore. They're educated. They're learning their history. They're not saying, oh, OK, the overthrow, you apologize for that. Please give us back our country. They're saying, we are still independent. You never took us over. In other words, they never took us over. We, we're just imagining, in a sense, that the United States has, has jurisdiction. What they have is power. They're holding these rib back exercises. They have power. The whole UN Security Council. The UN Security Council. But it's the longest running, most heinous, most egregious violation of international law that I can imagine. It's been going on, it's an occupation going on for 120 years. And I'll tell you two, just two things about the laws of occupation. One is the laws of occupation say that the occupier, the United States, can never acquire the sovereignty of the underlying nation that it occupies. Like in Iraq, the United States occupied Iraq, right? Iraq didn't go out of existence. Iraq was still Iraq. The United States eventually left Iraq. Now we're having all these problems. So the country that occupies can never take the sovereignty away from the occupied country. Rule number two, 
You have to leave as soon as possible. It's like being a guest in somebody's house. You don't stay over three days. You leave when the military basis for the occupation is over. And the occupation was based on what? The invasion of the Philippines. How long ago was that? That was in 1898. So they shouldn't be here, and they didn't acquire the sovereignty of the underlying kingdom of Hawaii. So if there are any questions, I'll take them. Yes. Um, I've been in court since 2009 against the Mormon Church, um, and we've been losing in the courts. Um, we've gone up to Ninth Circuit. We're uh, pro se litigants. Nobody will touch our cases. One, because we don't have money, and two, they're afraid to go up this law firm called uh, Homa Long Rose, and I forget the other uh, law firm. Um, right now, they're um, they're asking us for their attorney's fees of ninety-three thousand dollars, and so we want uh, we want to continue on this um, uh, this case all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court and saying about jurisdiction. I know how you feel because I took two cases 20 years ago. One I was a foreclosure case where I pushed the issue. Does Central Pacific Bank have jurisdiction? You proved, I said to Central Pacific Bank, that you acquired, or the United States acquired Oahu as this territory of the United States. For four months, we had hearings. They couldn't prove it. And after four months, they said, Your Honor, if what Professor Chang says is true, and we can't we can rebut it, then nothing we've ever done here has been legal. So I said, thank you for sharing. That's all we wanted you to say. <laughs> and what we, we dropped the case. We were hoping that, well, basically it blows up the system. Everything is illegal. Uh, what we wanted to make our point and have the United States and the state of Hawaii come to us and begin negotiating a solution, maybe a temporary solution, a transition towards independence. Nobody came, nobody wanted to talk. The second case, I had what they're threatening you with. They sanctioned me for $70,000. And this was uh, 16 uh, years ago, 17 years ago. So. We have to think, we think this. Uh, it is true, the courts are wrong, but the courts are afraid. The judges are afraid, the attorneys are afraid. They know they, it's, but they're, they're disobeying the most fundamental thing in law, which is the rule of law. The rule of law of the United States says that the courts don't have jurisdiction. The judges should know better. We have to hold up to them the examples uh, for example, what happened to judges in Nazi Germany who upheld the laws of Nazi Germany not doing the right thing, the moral thing. They sent people to their death. They uh, exterminated, they sterilized people. They were put on trial after World War II in the Nuremberg proceedings. So those are war crimes. Those were violations of international human rights. What we have to do is convince judges, find a judge who's brave enough to say in effect, for the first time, you're right. You're right. I'm going to do my job. The oath I took was to obey the Constitution. That's all I'm doing. I'm obeying the U.S. Constitution and U.S. laws. Let the Court of Appeals say I'm wrong. Now, once we make that, once we get that, we've made our point. I think we've made our point anyway. If we educate all the people to realize that this is a charade, we've made our point. We can make it in the courts, but we could start with people who have an obligation to tell the truth, and that would be the judges, and that would be the lawyers of an obligation of candor. Subject matter jurisdiction is the most fundamental in law. If you don't have it, nothing is valid, even a judgment. So you're doing the right thing. What we have to do is organize all these cases. So we present one big powerful case. One case so that people are not alone like you were, you are, and I was, 
So we're in with Fallout 2. So the whole Redwood Coast of Fallout Lake District <coughs> is under siege by all these large landowners. Right. We in Laie have an interest in 6,194 acres. In Kualoa, we have interest in 1,152 acres. So you're not talking about small places, you're talking about Ahukua's. And they're, they're winning in our cases because they know we don't know the process, but we have been learning it. And so we're still going back in. Okay, well, I but understand. We need help. I know. I need help too. Okay. <laughs> yes. You know, we all know the problems that we face. You just explained to us. What I want to know is how we're going to fix that problem. How we're going to take back the power from the American government to my people. How we're okay, well, I don't have an answer other than what I just said, which is to begin by education. If everybody knows and we expose it to the world, and the world sees that the United States has violated the rights of the Hawaiian people for 120 years and has occupied Hawaii longer than any other country has been occupied, what should they do? They should sanction the United States. They should begin to put pressure on the United States. That's one way. Leon can speak about that. Dexter can speak about that. Dr. Sai can speak about that. So then in our case, we can do a motion to reconsider after the decisions that were made against us, like the health government, some Yeah, judgment. right. Okay, thanks. But you should not have to pay that 93000 Right, okay. So okay. I'm not the best one to ask about all this, but I know that the United States holds itself out as the leader of the free world, protector of the democracy, the protector of values that uh, were true on July 4th and the year that they became independent, consent of the people. They violated all this, but even, I don't think even the Department of Interior is educated. I don't think they know. I don't think President Obama knows. I think the first thing is to get it out there and to challenge their holding themselves out as having the high moral ground. I think they know because um, at the Nanakuli meeting, I, I, I questioned the Attorney General and I told him that it will take two-thirds of at least 38 states vote to change the law. But what documents they are placing on us at these meetings is not laws. They are placing groups. They change, they change this thing around. Instead of calling it laws, they call it rules. Rules you can change every day. Laws you cannot. You need at least two thirds of 38, the votes of at least 38 states in the United States to change any law by, by, by Congress. So, uh, ever since I, 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 I questioned the Attorney General that at the Nanakuli DOI meeting, he's gone. No longer around. None of the other meetings he attended. That just proves to me and shows to me that he knows being in that meeting, he was breaking the law. That's why he disappeared and no longer want to be around. Okay, um, uh, Hank, uh, where are you? I want to, I want to uh, ask Leon and Dexter to come up at this point. Can I ask you a question before you? Okay, after that, Dexter and Leon can okay. come up because... Yeah. And I, I do want them to participate too. Right.